Welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show, hosted by Mason Kern. He keeps his nose to the ground to report on what's trending in professional and college sports, to inform, enlighten, and entertain. And now it's... The Sports Watchdog! The Sports Watchdog, Mason Kern. Hey everyone, welcome to the Sports Watch Dog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm your host Mason Kern here with you every Sunday from 7.30 to 8 a.m. And obviously, I'm certainly glad you decided to join me this morning. And as always, I do have some great stuff in my kennel. Today, in his second appearance on the show, we'll be talking to Mark Eaton, the NBA All-Star and two-time Defensive Player of the Year, as well as Vance Johnson, the former NFLer. I'll also be covering some sports hot topics, and as usual, for you basketball-specific fans, interesting happenings on the hardwood. So in sports hot topics this week, I mean, there's there's a plethora of things that we can get into here, guys. We can talk about the NFL and football update. We can talk about NCAA football. Uh, that That's midseason. We can talk about... UFC 229 with the Conor McGregor and Khabib Nur- Nurmagomedov fight. But what I think is most prevalent right now outside of, of course, UFC 229, which, which did happen on Saturday. But but I want to focus on baseball. We are in the MLB playoffs. The wild cards have happened. We're going to look into the division series now. But if you look at those two wild card games, Colorado Rockies taking on a pretty, pretty talented team in the Chicago Cubs. And I feel like a lot of people had, had kind of written Colorado off. Uh, I mean, they came out with a pretty nice slogan in Rocktober, but they're taking the Chicago Cubs, and I feel like a lot of people just expected the Cubs to kind of breeze over this game. Well, it, it went to extras, 13th inning. I mean, I was watching the game. I was in the ninth, and I was like, my, my friends and I were watching it. We're like, okay, what is this going to extras? What What's going to be the, the final deal here? And and at the end of the day, I was like, ah, I think maybe the 13th inning. And I was right. Ends in 13. Colorado escapes with a victory. They move on, taking on Milwaukee. The Brewers, win, uh, who won their division in the division series. And the Brewers... I really hadn't paid that much attention to all that much, but in looking at their season as a whole, I mean, what a what a story. I mean, getting Christian Yelich, who's most likely going to be the MVP this year in the NL, the NL MVP, after getting traded from Miami last year in the offseason. I mean, think about it like this. Miami had three players in Giancarlo Stanton, Christian Yelich, and Ozuna, Marcelo Ozuna, who, who are very productive players, and they traded them all away. Obviously, Giancarlo is now... Uh, with the New York Yankees, who also won their wild card games against the Oakland Athletics. Then you had Christian Yelich, who's Mike, most likely going to be the NL MVP this year. And then uh, Marcelo Zuno narrowly misses the playoffs. He's on the St. Louis Cardinals, but he had a, a pretty productive year as well. So w- Miami really could have done something special had they gotten pitching, and and that's just one thing they didn't have. But but looking at it, Milwaukee back to to the Brewers. Yelich has been a monster. He's playing extremely well. And and this Rockies Brewers kind of kind of series is going to be really interesting. I mean, the first game already w- went to extras. Pretty exciting walk off with Mustakis getting uh getting the the single to win the game. But uh, in in the other side of the bracket, you have the Yankees who won their wild card, like I said, against the Oakland Athletics. Um, the Yankees are hot right now. I mean, their lineup is pretty dangerous. Aaron Judge, John Carlo, like I said, getting traded from uh the Miami Marlins. Um, but their entire lineup, you got Luke Voigt, who's playing really well right now. Their two rookies, Glaber Torres, Miguel Andujar, also playing extremely well. But uh, Andujar is probably the rookie of the year, in my opinion. Um, but Glaber is also in that conversation as well as Shohei Otani uh, on the Angels. But, I mean, this MLB playoff is going to be really exciting. Now the Yankees are taking on the Red Sox in obviously the, one of the biggest rivalries in all of sports in the division series. Um, if the Yankees can stay hot, I can see them pulling out a victory. But, man, Mookie Betts and Boston and J.D. Martinez and their whole lineup is very special too. So MLB playoffs, really exciting. Uh, let me know what you guys think, who you guys think is going to win this year's World Series. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, but uh, if you're not the – the biggest baseball aficionado, you can just stay right here at the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. <laughs> All right, guys, don't go away. The Sports Watchdog Radio Show is going to be right back. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back after this. If you're losing your hair or notice that it's getting thinner, listen closely. 
you can do something about it without messy lotions or drugs. Now you can get clinically proven hair growth results at home with the HairMax Laser. HairMax delivers nourishing laser light energy to stimulate hair growth right at the roots. It's FDA cleared, recommended by doctors, and best of all, it has an amazing 93% success rate in clinical studies in both men and women, so you can be sure it works. Use it just three times a week and experience new hair growth, increased density, and healthier, fuller, more attractive hair in just weeks with a five-month money-back guarantee. Now, for a limited time, save 15% on your HairMax order at HairMax.com. Type in code RADIO at checkout or call 1-800-9-REGROW. That's HairMax.com code RADIO or 1-800-9-REGROW. Experience real hair growth and save 15% with HairMax. Hey there, you're listening to the Sports Watch Star Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix, and I'm your host, Mason Kern. Joining us now is an exciting guest. For the second time on the show, it's Mark Eaton, the former NBA All-Star Center and current president of 7foot4.com. Mark's defensive prowess at his 7'4 stature led to an all-star berth in 1989 and two Defensive Player of the Year awards in 1985 and 1989 as well. His entire NBA career was spent with the Utah Jazz. Since his retirement, Mark has become a corporate speaker and published author, and he's here to catch us up on his post-NBA endeavors, his book, and also share some insights about the NBA during his time in the league. So with that, hey Mark, welcome back to the Sports Watch Star Radio Show. Thanks again for being here. Oh, thank you, Mason. Great to be back with you. Yeah, I'm so glad you decided to come back on the show. So so first off, since the last time we talked, I know uh, we were talking a bit about your book as well, but can you tell us just a little bit more about it for those tuning in for the for the first time or just for those who need a refresher? I know it's called The Four Commitments of a Winning Team, but what will readers really, really gain from, from reading the book? Well, sure. I, uh, I've been uh, out doing speaking to businesses for about the last 10 years, and the book is kind of a result of that. It's a combination of my experiences and some business stories uh, designed to help people be better managers, be better employees, and better human beings, all based on uh, what it takes to be a winning team from the inside out. You know, the, the unique thing about playing the NBA for 12 years is uh, get to see teamwork up close and personal, and business owners could use that term but I don't think they always really understand it. And so I go a little bit deeper inside of that to share the inner workings of what makes a team really work. Right. And, and at surface level, because obviously we don't have enough time to go into it as, as in depth, but can you kind of describe at service level, what, what are the commitments of a winning team? How, how does that process work? Sure. So it starts uh, really uh, with yourself and then kind of extends out to the people around you. So the first commitment is really about knowing your job, doing that one thing you're excellent at and uh, not worrying about the things you're not good at, but focusing more on your strengths. And I share a story that uh, uh, with an interaction I had with Will Chamberlain one day. Uh, number two is uh, doing what you've been asked to do. Uh, it's about execution. It's about uh, finding out what people really want from you. Uh, number three is about making people look good, that the better you make people look good around you, the better you're going to look to them. And the last one is about really protecting your teammates, really being there for them, letting people know that you have their back. Right, yeah, and I mean, those those values definitely, like, coincide all together, making making the, the perfect workings of a winning team for sure. Now, you also mentioned, I mean, playing and having an interaction with Will Chamberlain. I mean, you played in, in a time in the NBA where – it featured some of the league's greatest centers. So how does it feel knowing that you were able to make that, that strong an impact, make an all-star team during that era and play against some of the the game's greatest? Well, if you know anything about my story, I didn't start out really wanting to be a basketball player. I was right. an auto mechanic at age 21. And, uh, uh, and as I uh, was, you know, kind of coached, uh, coached back into being a basketball player and then eventually going on to UCLA and, Playing in the NBA for 12 years, I came in at a great era in the early 80s uh, with guys like Bob Lanier and Artis Gilmore and Kareem and and uh, all the way through to, you know, Patrick Ewing, David Robinson, and everybody else in between. And so it was a great time to play in the NBA because there were just so many um, outstanding players at that time, just legendary players that I got to play against. And, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot of things at the same time. Yeah, and I mean that transition from from like you said, I mean, be really focusing on auto mechanics, and then and then going to UCLA, getting coached up, then going to the NBA, and then finally, I mean, making an All Star team, two Defensive Player of the Year awards. How were you kind of able to kind of just take the bull by the horns, really, and transition into an elite basketball player? 
Well, I always kept working, and and uh, Wilt Chamberlain, you know, grabbed me one day in the men's gym at UCLA and said, you know, stop chasing all the little players uh, that are faster than you, but park your rear end underneath the basket and block shots and stop players from getting there, and that's something you can be really great at. And I embraced that and the one thing on the court that I could be really, really good at and uh, continue to focus on that. And and, uh, and when you get to the NBA, you really don't know what kind of condition you need to be in. You, you just you just haven't experienced it. And so I doubled down when I got to the NBA and really hit the weight room and spent more time running and, and, and learning the game, listening to the coaches and, um, and trying to find out that, you know, find that one little place for me out of the court where I could, where I could hang and, and defense was the name of the game for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, and I just kept working at it and I was, and I was really good at it, really good at defending the basket, really good at stopping guys, uh, you know, like Walter Davis from getting to the basket. And so, um, that, that worked, uh, that worked well for me and, 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 uh, ended up being, uh, you know, a great, a great career lasted a lot longer than I thought I would and, and ended up making a home for myself here in Utah at the, in the process. Right, yeah. I mean, pretty cool also that you, you were able to spend your entire career with one team in, in the Jazz. So that's that's definitely really cool as well. Now, I mean, like I said, playing against some of the game's greatest centers. Now, in today's NBA, the league has really shifted from from a league full of dominant centers to, to quick guards, three-point shooting. So what can you kind of attribute that to? And, and what have you seen in, in how the game has kind of evolved over time? Well, the game has evolved because uh, I, I think largely because of the international influence, uh, and it's also because players have become even more specialized than my era. Uh, and the three-point line has become a much bigger deal. Uh, right. You know, when in, when I played, like you know, we had Daryl Griffith on our team, who I think he shot 33% from the three-point line, and that was considered excellent um, at that point in time. Now LeBron shoots like 45% from the three-point line, and so it's become a much bigger aspect of the game and it's caused uh, i think coaches and general managers to think more about i need more guys out there and the inside game isn't quite as important as it was because now it's more slashing and cutting as opposed to pounding it in the low post that being said though when it comes to playoff time everyone is still looking for the big defensive stopper or some way to shut down other teams so uh i think there's still a place for the for the big man but but to your point, you know, the, the Dirk Nowitzkis and people like that that are the more more versatile three-point shooters seems to be the name of the game at the moment. Although I'm still going to throw out Rudy Gobert with the Jazz right now because <laughs> I think he's he's got a little bit of both going on. He's not really a three-point shooter, but um, he's got a nice, you know, jump shot game, and he's pretty effective inside, and he's tremendous at the defensive end of the floor. Right, yeah. I mean, like you say, there's still definitely a place – for those those shot blockers, defensive minded minded big men, especially because you look at last year's draft or this this past draft, uh, a center from University of Arizona, DeAndre Ayton, went number one overall. So still still people right. find value in, in the centers for sure. Now as we talk a, a little bit about transition, I mean I I talked about kind of your transition into basketball um, from from really not playing that much before into kind of an elite stature, but. At the end of your career, then, how was it kind of transitioning from the basketball world back into into post basketball, the world of business and such? How were you able to go about that? Uh, it's a crazy time because you know you've done one thing for 16 years or so, right. uh, completely focused on it, and all of a sudden you can't do it anymore. And then uh, you know you get the menu out, and you're like, "There's a lot of pages in this menu, things you could potentially do," and you want to make good decisions and and. Uh, and try and find something that still scratches that itch of, of competitiveness and uh, get the adrenaline rush and everything you experienced while you were a player. And so sometimes that leads guys into, into businesses they shouldn't get into. Um, I've been fortunate from that standpoint in, in the things that I've got involved with post-basketball, um, but it's not easy. Uh, and I'll tell you that your body's beat up, but it's tough. You, you're on the road all the time. Now you're home all the time. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, that get challenged uh, with that transition, um, but um, you know I've been able to do some things. I did some broadcasting for a while and ran some youth programs and been in the restaurant business for 24 years. And here the last 10 years or so, I've been out doing the corporate speaking thing, which is which is kind of fun because I I still get to out to be with people. I get to tell basketball stories. It's challenging. It's competitive, um, and it does it definitely scratches that itch. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I think a lot of people can definitely take a page out of your book in, in terms of all of the, the different endeavors you've kind of been a part of since since your basketball career at least ended. Well, Mark, thank you again so much for, for coming back on the show. Where can fans go to get more information or, or just to connect with you? Uh, my website, 7foot4.com, and uh, you can find my book, The Four Commitments of a Winning Team, at uh, online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. Well, there you go, guys. Make sure to go check out the book. Check out the website as well. Lots of great info, and uh, I'm sure you guys all need some of that in your life. Thanks again, Mark. All right, everyone. The Sports okay. Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. We'll be right back after this. If you're ready for a boast-worthy staycation, the AAA Four Diamond Hermosa Inn, located in Scottsdale's Paradise Valley, is for you. This luxury hotel offers authentic Arizona character and charm. Its 43 newly renovated casitas are nestled in a garden setting with breathtaking views of the lush desert and Camelback Mountain. Most accommodations include deep soaking tubs, beehive fireplaces, and private patios. Other property features include a lively bar and communal seating areas, on-site painting classes, free-use beach cruisers, seasonal poolside yoga, hot tub facilities, a business suite, and dining to die for. The Hermosa Inn is an ideal locale for small group getaways from weddings, intimate family vacations, and bachelorette weekends, even golf outings, board meetings, and executive retreats. And its award-winning on-site restaurant, Lawns, is renowned for globally inspired Arizona fare, complemented by a subterranean wine cellar. You can see amazing photos Photos of this and much more at HermosaInn.com. That's HermosaInn.com. Hey there, welcome back to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm Mason Kern, and on the line with us now is Vance Johnson, the former University of Arizona and Denver Broncos wide receiver. Vance was selected with the 31st pick in the second round of the 1985 NFL Draft by the Broncos and spent his entire 10-year NFL career in Denver. He would make three Super Bowl appearances and win a gold medal in the Pan American Games in that time. However, a number of hardships and adversity forced Vance to take a different path, one that he's willing to share with us today. So with that, hey Vance, welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show. So excited that you could be here. Brother, love your show, man. Thank you so much for having me on today. Yeah, thank you again for taking the time. So so first off, I just want to kind of get into your background a little bit. How did you end up playing football at the University of Arizona as a Wildcat? You know, interesting enough, I grew up here actually in uh, Tucson, Arizona, where I finished high school and college, and I ran track and just loved it. And it was a way for me to kind of be inside of my head and make my dreams come true. Then I went to college here at the University of Arizona on an art scholarship, but I played football oh, wow. and ran track. And, you know, had plenty of accolades and was one of the best in the world. Got the gold medal at the Pan American Games. And so sports was uh, my life and my ability to hopefully be famous one day, right? And right. eventually I was offered a chance to get drafted or go to the 88 Olympics. I got alternate in the 84s. I decided to go to the pros and went to the Denver Broncos, drafted second pick, second round. So what was the, the kind of process in making that decision? I'm sure that was a tough one. So so how did you kind of pick between the two? You know, um, back in the 80s, uh, back in the 80s, Americans were not allowed to be an amateur in one sport and a pro in another sport. The rest of the world was wow. American. So they told me, listen, you have a chance to go to the Olympics and win the gold medal in 1988. However, if you opt for that, then you can't play pro football. Now, you know, I'd come from a background where it was important for me to get away from where I grew up in and around. And so I opted for the draft, and I was one of the – in fact, I was the fastest at the Combine there in Arizona State uh, in 1985. And then I was drafted by the Broncos, number 36, 31st pick, like you mentioned, and landed in Denver, Colorado, and the newspaper says, Broncos advance. <laughs> right, and I'm sure that was uh... – an amazing accomplishment for sure. So as you're kind of going through football as a college athlete, what's the mindset as you're kind of trying to get drafted? You know, the, the mindset for me was just to believe in myself. Ever since I was a child, I always was an overachiever by knowing that inside my mind, if I believed that I could achieve something and I put my body to that test, then I was able to reach those goals. And it was like that since I was a child. So even through high school and through college, I worked harder than the kids that I saw that I was going to compete against because I knew that they were doing certain things and I was going to do more than them because I also went to practice with them. When I went through college, it was the same way. I played two sports with track and field and football, but I worked harder than everybody else because I believed in myself. Now, I didn't know that this was eventually going to run into a real bust off for me and almost destroy my life, but believing in myself was what catapulted me into the ranks of being one of the best in the world. 
Right, and before we kind of get into into any of that, I know you, you get drafted by Denver, you land in Colorado. So what was kind of the most memorable aspect of being a Bronco for those 10 years? You know, the most memorable aspect about being a Bronco was obviously the three amigos, myself, Mark Jackson, Ricky Natil. Right. We had one great quarterback in John Elway. So he was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and we had amazing comebacks during our career. John would always call on me late in the game to make these big catches to win these ball games, and he had faith in me, and so I'd never drop passes. Also, just being in that limelight and being for the first time in my life at a Super Bowl at age, what, 23 years old, standing there on the sidelines, knowing that since I was seven years old, I wanted to be in that position. So there were so many highlights during my career, and I felt invincible out there in the field. Now, off the field, I live a little bit crazy, but on the field, I was magic, man. And it was great to play with the great John Elway. And I was blessed to go to three Super Bowls and one against the Giants. I had five catches, about 140 yards or so. And I would have been the runner-up MVP, but the Giants beat us that day. But we'll talk (laughs) about that just in case you got Giants fans listening. Right, right. And I'm I'm sure, I mean, being so young and, and making the Super Bowl is kind of achieving the pinnacle of, of kind of your dream was, was, I'm sure, pretty special for sure. So then when and why did kind of all of your success suddenly shift and things kind of start to go a little bit downhill? Well, I'll tell you why, brother. So when I was a child, man, I grew up around a lot of domestic violence and a lot of abuse. And like I said, I disappeared in my head and right. I started participating in sports. Well, as time went on, I didn't know that those mental health problems would catch up with me. I didn't know that not knowing how to navigate life because I didn't grow up around a father who was showing me how to value love and value women and value relationship and value knowledge. I didn't have those things. All I had was money that fed my flesh. Well, when I had a failed relationship in the NFL, when I had failed uh, things happening on the field, when I had failed so many different things, my only coping was to drink alcohol. Then when I had injuries, I started adding pills. I started taking opiates. And with the pills and the alcohol, I was brave. Then I started having more relationships. I started making babies. Then I started leading marriages because I didn't know how to navigate marriages. Then I started getting in trouble on the highways, going 140 miles an hour, getting pulled over by cops. And they were brushing it under the rug. So I was living in addiction, but it was hidden because of my fame out there on the football field. Right. And and kind of the, the process then for, for overcoming all of that adversity because – I'm sure it was a, a tough and challenging road. So so how then were you kind of able to kind of pick yourself up by the bootstraps and say, hey, enough of this, and, and kind of get back on the right track? You know, honestly, I wasn't even able to pick up my bootstraps myself because, brother, I, after my career was over with three Super Bowls and 10 years, a couple failed suicide attempts, I ended up losing a child. He got killed by a drunk driver. Wow. And like before, my coping was to you. So I drank more alcohol, I smoked more marijuana, and I took more pills. And I used for two years straight after he got killed, and I used myself literally into a coma. 26 days, I laid there chained to a bed with tubes hanging out of me and people coming saying goodbye to me. My sister took a deathbed picture of me that I carried around. I wish I could show it on the air. And when I woke up and I looked up into the sky and I asked God, is this how it all ends for me? I realized that there was nothing I could do, and I was powerless over this addiction. And that's when my – you don't have enough time on your radio show – seventh ex-wife reached out to the NFL saying that I was killing myself and they contacted me and said we know you're in trouble we'll help you and after crying out to a mighty God that I believe in I heard the Lord tell me I needed to go get help and I needed to be alone and get help in the treatment facility and so I got on the airplane and flew to Florida man and went to treatment and being in treatment I started to hear the stories of other men underlying issues that they were dealing with and then I realized the only reason why I played in the NFL in the first place was to have a mighty fall so that I can have a platform and be a voice of change and hope for anyone that's looking to get sober. Right, and and I mean, obviously, so much pain and suffering just to kind of realize that this is kind of the path that you were kind of meant to be on, inspiring others with your story. And you mentioned that that platform giving you the opportunity to do so. So what kind of advice then would you give? Obviously, for you, asking for help was was, was tough, but it ended up being kind of a saving grace. So, so you know, it's what, interesting, man. You're obviously a, a young man of wisdom, and I can hear it in your voice. So I appreciate that. Right now, the the, whole, the the message for me is this: for those people who have loved ones who are suffering, I'm an outreach spokesperson for Futures Recovery Healthcare. I would encourage people to look me up on Facebook. I'm very transparent, and I promise to try to find someone treatment, no matter where they are in this country, no matter what their economical background is. I'm going to get people help. The goal, however, on the other end is for people who to know that everyone doesn't grow up. No one really wants to grow up to be an addict. And so with love and compassion and understanding where they are, 
and then knowing that somebody's sobriety has your name on it. There are many people out there that don't know what to do. Well, guess what? There's someone that's hurting out there that you can help get into treatment. You can help move into the direction where they can get clean and sober. And then recovery is a lifetime. It's a lifestyle, actually. It's a lifestyle. And so I want to encourage people to have hope, to know that treatment's available, to get educated on what's happening with this addiction and how it's changing the, literally, literally the content of the mind. Your mind changes when you're in, in the depths of addiction. And also now to go back home and take our kids and let's teach them who God is in the Bible. Let's give them a foundation so they don't find themselves lost in social media when they get older because all that's going to do is lead them down a path of lies and deception until they have to cope and use drugs anyway. You don't have enough time on the show, man, so we have to do this again one day. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure to, to have you back on. Now, w w as we are running out of time, Vance, thank you so much. Where can our listeners get go to get more info or just to connect with you? Well, you know what? You can go on VanceInspires.com on the, the, the website, or you can reach me on my Facebook page, uh, Vance Johnson Athlete, and I'm always active on my page to get people help. I work for Futures Recovery Healthcare, which is an inpatient treatment facility down in West Palm Beach, Florida, five minutes away from Tiger Woods' house. <laughs> That's a whole other story. So if you need some help, please, I'm begging you to reach out to me. There you go, guys. Make sure to go connect with Vance. Thank you again so much for your time, Vance. All right, everyone, the Sports Watch Star Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix will be right back after this. If you want more hassle-free air travel, get the Airhook, a two-in-one solution for airplane travel comfort. Not only is a stable drink holder also a secure mount for electronics like a cell phone or tablet, it also easily attaches to the tray table in a locked position as an anchor, so you don't need a tray table laying horizontally across your lap, resulting in maximum leg room. Find it at theairhook.com. You ready to hoop it up? This is Happenings on the Hardwood. All right, guys, as always, at the end of the Sports Watch Talk Radio Show here on NBC Sports Radio, AM 1060 Phoenix, we're going to pivot on over to the hardwood, talk some hoops talk, and we are officially in preseason basketball. That's right, we are less than 10 days away now from the start of the regular season, my favorite time of year. Um, the preseason, I mean, it's shown some glimpses of, of some players who are really going to be pretty dominant, I think, this year. Uh, Brendan Ingram on the Lakers having a breakout game with 31 points of finally getting a win for the Lakers their first of the preseason but I think I mean for a majority of their preseason has just been kind of messing tinkering with lineups Luke Walton seeing who works well with who um obviously Lonzo Ball's been injured so they've been starting with Jean Rondo um and LeBron just doing LeBron things I mean not really playing that aggressive that hard yet I mean still showing some glimpses of of some nice play in this preseason year 16 for him. So uh, I, I've gone over it a number of times. This Lakers team is going to be pretty pretty special. Definitely, I think, going to make the playoffs this year. Um, how far they go, that remains to be seen. Uh, I think it's still the Golden State Warriors to lose. But in local news, the Phoenix Suns preseason – I mean, from what I've seen, DeAndre Aiden looks like the clear-cut number one pick. He's played like a man amongst boys. Granted, it's the preseason. Don't want to overhype it because obviously a lot changes when, when it comes down to the actual regular season. But, I mean, multiple 20-point games, double-doubles, and, and DeAndre Aiden has really played like an NBA, uh, a seasoned NBA player, player which, is, which is pretty encouraging to see for Suns fans. Now, Ryan Anderson... And Trevor Ariza haven't done too much. I mean, they're not going to overwork them in the preseason. But Elie Okobo is someone who I look to make a, a pretty decent impact this season as a rookie. Uh, Shaq Harrison also coming back. I'm going to look for his defense and, and another um, impactful year from him um, on, on really both sides of the ball. But but this Suns team, it's it's a little bit revamped. Devin Booker shooting with his right hand after after – having surgery on it um he's kind of getting back into game action um and and he's gonna I mean like I said before he's does not want to miss the playoffs anymore he wants to lead this Suns team to the playoffs but I still don't really see it happening this year if they're in the Eastern Conference maybe they have a better chance but in this stacked Western Conference I just don't see it happening now that doesn't mean that in a few years maybe one or two they get some pieces get a, another top five draft pick Maybe they can do something, but as of right now, this Suns team does not look like a playoff team in the Western Conference to me. But I, I think you'll see some improved play from Josh Jackson make a sophomore year leap. Um, DeAndre Ayton, like I said, is going to have a, a pretty good rookie year. He'll be an all-rookie first team uh, should he stay healthy. 
And and I think that you're going to see some things out of this Suns team that you like. Um, I don't think they're going to start the year with four 40-point losses like they did last season. Very discouraging. I think this is the, this is the year that, that the Suns kind of start to make that turn uh, to be a successful franchise. And you'll see that coming at the start of the season. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Anybody wanting to connect with me, the Sports Watchdog, on Twitter can do so at a Sports Watchdog. And on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well at the Sports Watchdog. Watchdog. So until next time, keep your eye on the ball. The Sports Watchdog. The Sports Watchdog, Ace and Kern.